Thank you, Mr. Tugmasan, for coming here today. The first question I have two questions. The first is a conceptual question, the second is a situational one. The conceptual question is as follows. Before becoming a minister, you uh, were engaged in constitutional reform. The part related to the Justice Council, courts, independence of the courts, creation of independent courts. So this part of the Constitution, you as a practitioner, do you think what we have in the Constitution is enough to safeguard the independence of our courts? If I try to be brief, and my questions will, well, my answers will be brief. Yes, I think it is enough. It's sufficient. And if I were to rephrase these provisions with some editorial changes, I would have kept the same concepts. And there is no need to change. At uh, the level of constitution, the independence of the judiciary from the executive and the legislature is essentially guaranteed and safeguarded. And the independence of the judiciary or understanding of the essence of administration of justice uh, as much as it pertains to each individual judge it's not up the constitution to ensure it's a process and it's not only constitutional reform that should take care of that if we go back to 95 constitution then naturally we did not have any safeguards for independence of the judiciary these were missing the next constitution provided for such safeguards but it's just one of the links in the total chain to be followed by other steps which unfortunately are stalling uh, whereas uh, importance of some other issues is not yet understood by the society and i have a group of students and their responses to surveys illustrate the following uh, quite a few of our uh, population are ready and willing to uh, pay bribes to have their issues settled, which is a very painful reality, but we have to deal with the society. We need to change the society, and there is another thing, and we have to go through a fairly daunting process to get there, and uh, you cannot uh, get there overnight. You cannot secure a desired outcome overnight. There is a combination of steps that you have to take, uh, but without addressing this issue, whatever you do in the society, any reform uh, will be doomed to failure until and unless we have this issue resolved. I'm sure there'll, have, there'll be more questions concerning this issue. The next situational question. On the 26th of May, in the National Assembly, you said that the amnesty will help relieve us of the sad memories of the past or we relieve us of the sad duty to remember the sad events of the past so the amnesty happened the society and the political forces have they forgotten the unpleasant events of the past or it's still there relevant as ever uh, it's been a bottleneck that we overcame there are more bottlenecks to be overcome. There are more things to be done. We have an issue with organizing our society anew. And more or less the situation we had was that when you have to cure the body and to, to cure the the body and to understand the pain, uh, there is some small part of the body that causes pain and instead of thinking and considering the whole body you focus on the source of pain this is where we are right now this doesn't mean that there is nothing else to take care of in our body uh, but then if you have if you keep referring to it you can't forget about it and you ignore all other issues which you may have so we should probably address this toothache point at this stage and then move on to other ailments. Now we move on to questions from the audience. Who would like to ask a question? Let me introduce myself. A monitoring group of the Ministry of Justice, Penitentiary System Monitoring Group member. 
the monitoring group with the Ministry of Justice and I'm also with uh, an NGO against violation of law. Georgetta Mestropian is the name. I have two questions. The first question. It's about the amnesty. We have, after the president signed it, we have numerous complaints, not only from individual penitentiary institutions about injustice happening there. Uh, it appears that we have lots of complaints from all penitentiary institutions uh, stating that the state of affairs and conditions of the families of the inmates were not taken into account uh, during the uh, amnesty. My second question concerning the first question, I kind of fail to understand. There are people who are unhappy about the amnesty because of the social straits of the families of the inmates. Which body, the amnesty body, the amnesty board, there is no such an amnesty board. At the Ministry of Justice, there is a, please let's uh, not get confused, there is no such body in place. The penitentiary institution takes a decision, uh, the prosecutor endorses it. There is no such board taking decisions. If there is something you complain about, please, and then let's not exaggerate, and let's not to date. Uh, we're 10 days into the amnesty. I received just one complaint about that. These people shouldn't be complaining to you. They should be complaining to the Ministry of Justice. Uh, as long as it has to do, their complaints have to do with the, uh, with the penitentiary institutions. And on the 26th, we had the amnesty. On the 27th, 300 people were set free. And this has been an unprecedented development because uh, previous amnesties demonstrated that all that delays uh, bring about certain risks and the whole penitentiary department has been working late at night to make sure that these people are set free as early as possible. And please don't try to cast a shadow on these good deeds and please do not come up with such statements because there is no such a thing. There is just one complaint follow the media which is very sensitive and is sure to respond fast. I assure you there is, there is nothing of the kind happening uh, because the department in charge of the penitentiary has been instructed to be careful when it comes to any complaint when it comes to the amnesty. Uh, the next question is about life sentences who keep petitioning for release. This is someone beyond the scope of the ministry's jurisdiction. Anyone else? Mr. Khajagan. You said when Adam asked you his question, independence of courts and the rest of it, you basically said or you basically refer to the theory of it, the way it's enshrined in the Constitution. But when it comes to practice, I'd like to ask your opinion as that of a practicing lawyer. What is it that we need to do to ensure the independence of the courts? And then what should we do to change people's attitudes that they don't trust courts and the previous speaker, the ombudsman, said that the lion's share is against the courts. This is number one. Mr. Khajakian, uh, let him answer your first question first. I said it as a joke once, but more than half of the joke was I meant it. I need a device like an x-ray device to screen any everyone and to show me if this person is capable of administering justice because let me repeat it's in the bones because testing it screening for it is difficult people in their Monday relations in their family with their friends when you're not unfair at this level you cannot become a judge and administer justice fairly so, new system of values, people championing this new system of values, this is what we need. And the secondly, I'm trying to highlight one of the issues. The second issue is that the legal framework, when it comes to all possible corruption risks, conceivable corruption risks, is trying to keep the system immune from them. 
wherever you see room for discretion by the judges. The legal framework is trying to safeguard the system against that. But it's the mentality and it's making sure that we close the loop, that we incessantly amend the legal framework, improve it to close all possible loops. Failing that, we will not address the issue successfully. And then, uh, following up on my previous answer, there should be a demand in the society for justice. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's not like I want justice and it happens. And if it's about my neighbors or friends, doesn't matter. So there should be demand in the society. Has the society demanded justice unanimously? Does everyone in this society crave justice? When we get there, it will be very easy to ensure justice because as we reflect on the Armenian's history, whenever we came up together, uh, it was easy to accomplish. Please introduce yourself. I'm Nahid Khachatryan. I'm a doctor. Armenian courts blatantly unfair decisions resulted in quite a few people getting deprived of their property. And we have a vicious circle in place. What mechanism could we come up with to make sure that people either get their property back or get restituted? And the judges were at fault. There are specific procedures in place. There is a verdict that's enforced. I have to state with regret, no matter how much I, in my professional or personal capacity, I uh, sympathize with you uh, and I would like to reach out with you. We have quite a few such cases. Uh, but, and in such cases, the train is long gone. We have court decisions that have entered into their legal force and we need new circumstances to revisit these cases. And as a human being, I share the concern and the pain of these people who suffered uh, because of unfairness of the courts. But as a Minister of Justice, I have to see what we need to do to prevent it from happening in the future. At the first glance, the name of the Ministry of Justice, it's kind of misleading in a way, as if we're in charge of administration of justice, which is not the case. We have several tools, several instruments to address this issue. It's the legal framework because uh, the responsibility with designing, developing uh, the penal and procedural legal framework is with us. And then we instigate proceedings. So along both lines, specific steps were taken. Now, on the agenda of the Ministry of Justice, we have uh, amendments uh, to the Code of uh, Administrative Procedure and new uh, Penal Code and Judicial Code amendments, comprehensive amendments, that is, solutions that were in place, which uh, were very much in line, I have to tell you, with international instruments. Uh, Venice Commission uh, commented on these European structures, positively commented on this. These are the cases where that it's not always that whatever works elsewhere effectively works in this part of the world. And the second toolkit, let me repeat, is the disciplinary proceedings against judges, as I've mentioned. During this period, strange as it may seem, there hasn't been any proceeding instigated by the Ministry of Justice, disciplinary proceeding, but... Uh, there are quite a few such cases in the making, and we will see what happens. Karine Danielian, uh, she's over there. Please give her the mic. Uh, Diaspora Armenian Sasun from Athens is asking this question. I'm not sure if this is your turf. Uh, for signing documents and having them notarized for Schengen visa, you have to pay 11,000 drums, not considering the red tape. Any solution you could come up with? Uh, well, if, uh, if this is about apostilles, um, instead of previously established five days, the Ministry of Justice has reduced it to 24 period. 
Uh, so the documents that need to be translated and notarized, so the documents issued by the Ministry of Justice are translated and notarized within 24 hours. Uh, so when it comes to uh, having them uh, to notary in general, uh, the reforms that are happening will be covering this issue as well. So we'll be looking at eliminating the red tape and shortening the periods. I don't know where he took the money from. It's translation costs because it's not the stamp duty and it's also notarization as for because the government is not involved in this translation fees. It depends on the volume. Uh, thank you, Mr. Minister. I'd like to welcome this meeting and our encounter. Uh, what's your opinion about the fact that, uh, well, 10 years of experience demonstrates that when it comes to protection of environmental rights, we have not had any positive outcome in any court of law. And to illustrate the point that you brought up concerning the demand in the society, demand is there, uh, but it is banking against the wall. Uh, we have uh, cases of poisoning in Nubarashen. On Kanaker's uh, hydropower plant street, people for several years in a row have been trying to make sure that the green belt, sanitation belt, be not replaced with construction. And they've been fighting for this in the municipality. I complain, and the response that we get is that not a big deal. It's not the construction that will be moved elsewhere, but the sewer that will have to be removed elsewhere. But when we ask here Van Water Company, how come that you don't participate in this litigation as a plaintiff, Yerevan uh, Water Company responds that your courts are unpredictable. We started litigation on several occasions to no avail uh, and protection uh, green zones around uh, sewer lines are demolished for the sake of private construction. Another question has to do with the students' park, the academy complaint, national library complaint, inquiries were sent to the parliament, Ministry of Urban Development issued a statement that it's all against the law in violation of all norms, where it was to no avail, and uh, this private facility was built. The demand is there. At the same time, I have to remind you of some cases when uh, buildings were not built because of your complaints. A cafe in the vicinity of the Swans Lake, other cases, I'm grateful to you for your struggle, for your efforts, and we still have green areas there. Uh, several years ago, we could see chopped down trees all over the city, whereas now, even if one tree is being chopped down, it raises such a noise, such an agitation, that you cannot do that anymore. So the demand is there, and one has to think twice before doing that. I can't, of course, say that all issues have been taken care of, and I, as a minister, uh, should say what I think about this, uh, and this um, amnesty-related thing. Uh, sentences were replaced with softer terms, and 35 people in this framework in Gerard Kunik region and in Yerevan, they participated in um, public works to plant trees. And it was a new experience, and it was a positive experience in Shengavit and Yerabalud. These inmates, these convicts, participated in um, these public works uh, with a very positive outcome. And uh, in full, I'm sure, and in next spring, we will, uh, and we can do more on this. The issues that you have raised are indeed there. But as long as this issue is there, this 8% or 6%, this forested areas, of green areas, it's very little for this country. And we need to augment these areas. And it's everyone's wish. And let me assure you, any official prior to taking any decision to this end, some five years ago, it was so easy for them to sign a paper. Now they have to think twice, which is a step that we should take note of. But it's never enough. Uh, in greenest cities of the world, in Vancouver, in Berlin, they still have environmental issues, and we will continue having environmental issues. The demand will always be there, and it will always be ahead of whatever state is in a position to accomplish. Uh, but we should make it faster.
I share your concern with this, and I'm an ally of yours in this. Since we have just one hour, uh, my request to those asking the questions and you, Mr. Minister, try to keep it short. Radio Liberty, Havana Shorikan. Mr. Minister, Armenian National Congress continues to insist on extraordinary elections. I wonder what your opinion is from the legal perspective. Extraordinary presidential elections, extraordinary parliamentary elections. Is this possible? Is there a legal solution to this from the legal perspective? Uh, dissolving the parliament? No one has an absolute right to do that. Prior to 2005, under the previous constitution, prior to the constitutional reform, the president could at any point, just for political considerations, dissolve the parliament, uh, which uh, was a symptom of overpolarized of a concentrated political system after 2005. The grounds for dissolving the parliament are uh, stipulated in detail in the constitution, and the grounds are not there. And when people think that uh, they can do it uh, or they should do it uh, in violation of the constitution, this is not possible. Which means that there is no uh, legal way to hold extraordinary parliamentary elections in this country now. I am putting political, social, economic issues aside because uh, all this, uh, only after this, uh, we refer to the legal grounds. Whereas I think that the other grounds are uh, not there either. Uh, and we don't have the legal grounds uh, under the constitution in force. So before insisting on something, uh, my advice is to check the constitutionality of these demands. Tamara Abramian, Arasa NGO chairman, a uh, member of working group um, of uh, sustainable development program. I have two questions. One question, please. Two small questions. One small question. Uh, I represent three structures. I think I can ask two questions. The first question, you said that your students uh, conducted a poll and the findings were deplorable. 84% of the society are ready to engage in corrupt ways and means to have their issues settled. Why? Don't you think that there is a need to see why? The second question, under the sustainable development uh, strategy, under the social partnership arrangement, under the strategy in all ministries, including yours, uh, we have policy development board, of which NGOs are members, including uh, people authorized by the Sustainable Development Network. There hasn't been any meeting of this board to date. What does this mean? There hasn't been any such meeting scheduled or the Prime Minister's decision is not being acted upon. In response to your first question, I know why. I know answers to this whys. Uh, very often we don't ask this question why and try to grapple with the consequences. Uh, the reasons go back to many years ago. In one of my statements in the Parliament I tried I said that we should retrace our steps and identify the causes. Uh, if you want to find who is to blame, uh, well, the first one to blame uh, died several hundred years ago when we lost our independence. And since the 18th century, uh, in Western Armenia, uh, Turkey would uh, appoint uh, officials without any compensation established, and they collected bribes to survive. Then we had the Soviet Union, and everyone knew how it worked. And with this past, just one element of it I'm referring to, there are many other vices in our national life that account for this. And with this past, expecting speedy solution of our issues would be redundant. Our legal framework also contains some of the causes. Sometimes uh, one could break his or her neck for getting from point A to point B. You have to go through this dark and gloomy forest of the legal framework to get there. And then in the government we have a new initiative in place, the regulatory guillotine, which helps identify all redundant bureaucratic redundancies, ambiguities, uh, discretionary provisions, uh, assessment of the initial stage of uh, corruption-prone uh, 
um, provisions. Uh, so, like uh, this reference may be issued within um, a period of one to three months. This should be revisited. So it's so much easier to pay 1,000 drums than uh, act upon this provision. So there is an issue with our legal framework. There are uh, very deeply rooted causes. No one denies this. Uh, let's establish the status quo. Let's diagnose the status quo and then identify the causes of the status quo and then address them one by one. As for the board, we haven't convened any meeting of the board, but it's on the agenda. Human Rights in Armenia website, Karine Ionesian. Uh, issue of concern for the journalists. When uh, journalists go uh, to penitentiary institutions to have interview with inmates, uh, they are often denied the opportunity. I would like to know why, especially when it comes to uh, significant cases. Uh, I myself was denied uh, such interview. Manuk Samerjan was my prospective interviewee on the 20th anniversary of the case. This is, uh, well, in each and every case, uh, we should be specific, really. If you, you want to have an interview uh, with someone uh, who is in detention yet, uh, then, of course, uh, it will be denied. In all other cases, we should be specific to look at the grounds of the denial to see if it's been properly done or otherwise, the lady in black. Please introduce yourself. Helena Toyan, an architect. I have two questions, one very brief. Admission, do you have admission hours Saturday from 11 to 2? Uh, call this number and my assistant will take an appointment. And the second question. The DAC service is with the Ministry of Justice. Uh, the bailiff service is uh, within the system of the Ministry of Justice. Marian Gagoyan's case. Uh, after writing for eight years prior to be released, uh, she said that her assets have been transferred. And I appealed the decision. What's your question? Huge assets. And we are the owners. And from the same ministry, the bailiff service issued five, six letters. You're telling us about the circumstances of your case. What's the question? What can we do to arrange it in such a way as the bailiffs leave us alone before the court of a, the appellate court? takes his decision in view of the new circumstances. You ask your question. Let's move on. And the next question is with the European Court. You have to write to complain and uh, this procedural proceeding will have to be dismissed if there are grounds for that. Anna Muradian, Independent Weekly. Very recently, we received findings of a survey about those saving, serving life sentence. It turns out no one knows how much money it takes to keep an inmate sentenced to life term. Uh, some daily rates were mentioned. How much does it cost? No one will give you any specific figure. Take budget of penitentiary institutions, divide them by the number of those serving life term. It includes food, maintenance, clothing, everything. So it's a closed regime, closed arrangement, and they have equal apportionments across the system, I'm sure. You take the budget and you divide it by the number of inmates, you get 
the sum. Let me ask this question before the mic is transferred. Very simple question. Narek Safirian is the author. What do we need the Ministry of Justice for? We have the police, we have the courts, we have the legislature. Uh, well, look at the bylaws of the Ministry of Justice. It has nothing to do with the functions of the police. I can tell you in a couple of words that basically the gist about what the Ministry of Justice is for is being in charge of the legal framework that's developed. Not only in relation to the penitentiary, the bailiff service, notary, uh, civil acts registration. Beyond that, we're in charge of the legal integrity, consistency of the legal framework. Contradictions, conflicts, ambiguities within the legal framework. This is what the Ministry of Justice is in charge of. And also the tools that the system of administration of justice has to administer that justice, that is disciplinary proceedings. Hachatur Melkonyan, a citizen. Dear Mr. Minister, uh, the bailiff service for three years in a law. Uh, the court decision has not been executed and response that we get from your ministry is the same. It's in the process. Uh, if I start answering very specific questions, well, I'm not familiar with all these cases. I have 400 staff members. Each of them is looking at hundreds of cases. So I, 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 I don't know of the particulars of each and every case. It has to do uh, with the particulars of the case. Has it been uh, auctioned? Uh, has it been uh, foreclosed? The rest of it. Administrative proceedings take time. Uh, and it causes my concern that these periods are too long. And there are delays also from the perspective of upholding people's rights because there's been a decision that it's not being acted upon. And then this is very important for the business environment. In full, we will be coming up with a package concerning the periods, deadlines, uh, procedural ones, because the situation that we have uh, on the last couple of cases was just one new circumstances coming, circumstance coming up. Uh, procedure proceeding is repeated from scratch. Sometimes judges, judges and courts abuse this reasonable time frame bank up to the point that people lose interest in foreclosed assets. Uh, Rosanna Ghazarian, the Masona Fund, for 10 years, Armenia has been a, a signatory to Orhis Convention, and as Armenia joined the convention, uh, it assumed certain commitments, including setting up an independent structure to look into violations of Orhis Convention, up to the point of taking these cases to court. During these 10 years, what steps were taken in terms of setting up such a structure? Fortunately, I was fortunate uh, 10 years ago as I was a Deputy Minister of Environment to introduce, uh, to take the Oris Convention to the floor of the Parliament. Uh, I don't remember any such requirement. There were three requirements under the Convention participatory decision-making, public uh, discussion, and redress. Uh, so certain so steps were taken along all these three lines. And the fact that you are very unlikely to see any significant environmental initiative or decision to which environmentalists are not exposed or not participate, it's about uh, creation of, of taking cases to court at the government's expense. We have Dalman and Tehut violations. That is, the state covers the court expenses. Let's move on. Uh, 
Mr. Minister, you are different from other members of the government in a sense that you make political statements, which is a new phenomenon, and I will ask you a political question. In your statement in the parliament, you said, quote, it's high time to understand and realize that in the Republic of Armenia, it's not that we have mutually exclusive segments like opposition government society, but just one nation uh, with its issues and objectives. Several days after your statement, Ser Sarksan uh, expressed uh, willingness to act on the following, a new psychological transformation, a new formula, uh, individual rights and interests are sacred are as sacred as collective interests and rights. And some analysts, based on that, discern that the government is, the authorities are migrating towards nationalism. I have to confess several things. In my understanding, the position of the Minister of Justice is a very good expert position, and I considered myself a professional, an expert, so it was good for me to get into this and do laws. But it's a political position. Uh, so I'm in the process of transformation from a professional to a politician, making political statements, uh, taking political stances about uh, policy and politics happening in this country, I think it's uh, an issue for any minister, and I don't think there is anything unique about that. And then, uh, when the, if the uh, opinion of the Minister of Justice is in line with that of the President, um, I think it's natural as well. Uh, the contrary would have been strange within the same team. If this were the case, the Minister of Justice wouldn't belong there, because this is the philosophy of governance. And if there are similarities here, and if you look at definitions, the definitions are basically different, but the vector is the same. The direction is the same. And as we look at national issues, although liberal analysts, well, I don't uh, come up with such conclusion. I see nothing negative about that. We have a lot of issues. We have several other unresolved issues. And nations, when it comes to uh, protecting their identity, they will continue doing that. Uh, another thing is that we should reevaluate and reorganize our national life, the life of the society. It's a challenge, it's an urge to make a change. And if we understand it correctly, then the gaps, the mistakes that we committed in our national life in the past, uh, we can go back and address them. Uh, another important thing that I said in my statement was about what are these national goals? What are the goals that take us in the same direction? Uh, where we have no authorities concerned with persevering only, uh, we will not have a society or an opposition uh, with only objective to take over the authority when we don't have a society that fears for its future. And let's remember that throughout our history we didn't have too many moments uh, when everyone came together. Sardarabad, Karabakh, uh, and we succeeded, we prevailed. Uh, different political uh, beliefs, convictions, factions, the majority of the society still converged that there may be no concessions when it comes to Karabakh. And whatever authority becomes incumbent, uh, they will not be able to go against this prevailing opinion. And if we're capable of acting on this unity, we will prevail. This is what President was referring to as an NGO. Uh, under the European Convention, everyone has right to fear trial. In Armenia, this is somewhat corrupted. Uh, if we go to courts, uh, people have to pay uh, for litigation, for hiring uh, defense counsels. Can we, and they cannot afford it, can we create a system whereby all these uh, payments will have to be effected after decision is taken? 
because uh, mistakes are made and people have to pay the same fee for several times. It is possible. The Constitution reads that everyone is entitled to legal assistance and law on defense counsel provides for this public defender's arrangement. Uh, there will be a threefold increase in the Chamber of Advocates in Armenia's Bar Association. And uh, alimonies and related or similar cases, uh, they provide for free of charge assistance. And this it should be targeted, such assistance. Um, they should not depend on the circumstances or nature of the case. It should make sure that uh, all those entitled to fair trial should get it, irrespective of whether they can afford it or not. Uh, so, such a system should be targeted. Social groups. Ashot Mirzoyan, a movement of consumers. My intelligence is telling me that they're trying to introduce biometric passports. Your opinion, is this yet another step we take acting on Europe's instructions or we really need it? Your intelligence It's no secret. There is a government decision to this end as of 2012. Biometric IDs will be promulgated. Uh, it has to do with our European integration policy, this framework within which our passport needs to be more protected. So within the entirety of steps that will be an ultimate goal of visa-free regime. This is one of the steps within this framework. Uh, you shouldn't be afraid, you shouldn't be concerned. We will have more secure, more protected IDs, passports. My question is about uh, recent amendments of penal code, changing 15 years to 20 years. The question is as follows. There are some experts who believe uh, that this is a mitigation as far as life term is concerned. Will there be reviews of cases? Uh, there will be no review uh, because uh, in the context of these changes there may be reviews of cases uh, because uh, all double offenses as aggravating uh, circumstances have been removed as such and if people were convicted under provision whereby life term was uh, provided for third repeat offenses which were viewed as aggravating circumstances, this could serve as grounds for reviewing the case. But reviewing the case does not automatically imply that the punishment, that is life term, will be changed. Uh, because other parts of the corpus delicti without the repeat offense or crime in question, then these do not qualify for review of the verdict. David Zabrasian, a student, my question is as follows. What shortcomings do you think we have in the higher legal education? And are these shortcomings different from the ones we had while you were a student? Uh, I started a project. I'm not sure whether I'll be able to finish it because I'm too busy. Uh, some have this opinion that a good lawyer is the one who knows many laws. Unfortunately, during exams, you see that they ask questions about the Constitution and students recite the Constitution pursuant to Article 1, such and such of the Constitution. Armenia is a sovereign, democratic state, blah, blah, blah. This is not being a good lawyer. If you're a lawyer, uh, if there is an inmate in a penitentiary institution uh, with two years there, Rest assured that he knows the laws better than any lawyer. Uh, you were born a lawyer. You can, you can think as a lawyer or you cannot think as a lawyer. Uh, when my students uh, tell me that there is a lot they get from my lectures, they get this uh, knack for thinking like a lawyer. I don't know how you can teach this. My professor was telling me that the law is really, that the legal profession is about reading between the lines 
of a legal document, a law. So you're either able to do that or you're not. And then let me tell you that in the last three, four years, there has been a positive change here as well. And hopefully, we're moving in the right direction. Arman Suleimanian, Radio Van. Uh, Three and a half to four thousand drums are spent per each inmate. Uh, for comparison, uh, 800 drums are spent per each child in a kindergarten. People, uh, inmates don't eat what they are served, and hygiene uh, items and clothes are provided by the family members of the inmates. Don't you think that this penitentiary institution is a, an excellent business? Where does this money go? I don't understand where this money goes. Can you do anything about it? I once mentioned that the philosophy, uh, we should change the philosophy of penitentiary system. This philosophy implies the change of everything you have referred to. Even more than that, spending this money, much of it, little of it, spending it or misspending it or embezzling it, uh, we generate, we produce criminals. I know that the minister shouldn't be saying anything of the kind, but let me assure you that those who spend three to five years behind bars doing nothing, we have no systems to reintegrate them into the society, and these people are released. When they are released, they uh, lost their professional qualifications by now because they did nothing in three to five years. They have shattered families. They have issues with families. The society uh, rejects them because they carry this stigma uh, of a former inmate. Uh, this is the biggest problem as far as I'm concerned. The risk that you refer, do you've been referring to, I agree uh, or, or I disagree, it doesn't really matter. I... As I was getting appointed as a minister, I said that I'm not in favor of short-term, too visible, flashy solutions. And uh, this year budget, we had the ministry had one billion drums, and I was well in a position to uh, make appropriations for the penitentiaries to address the issues that you have raised, hygiene items. Uh, it's deplorable that. Uh, we have this situation, and in Sevan penitentiary. Uh, and where lavatories were outdoor. So it really had to be taken care of. But I refrained from short-term solutions, from uh, making quick gains to report. Instead, uh, I took a longer-term approach in Armavir Penitentiary and the cabinet session uh, endorsed the program whereby Two years down the road, we will have a completely new penitentiary institution. Uh, and all this issue will be taken care of there. I could do as Esopus, uh walk around, identify violators, punish them, raise a lot of noise, be flashy. I don't want to do that. I want to go for fundamental solutions solutions that have little to do with an incumbent of the minister's position. I want to make changes that will be impossible to overrule, uh, irrespective of who comes next as a minister. Because if a minister wants to... Let's establish a system whereby a minister is not in a position to do anything within an established system that runs smooth. Uh, and I have to tell you that I don't have answers ready for uh, everything across the spectrum. I'm trying to listen to the experts, I'm trying to listen to the practitioners, and I'm trying to come up with durable solutions. Uh, and knowing and not reporting is actionable, as you know. I'm from overseas. An il um, elected member of the executive of All Armenian Union. 
Mr. Minister, is there such a connection between the Ministry and Association of Armenian Lawyers, Prosecutors? Uh, could we uh, ensure closer cooperation? Just a month ago, uh, my first visit, uh, my first meeting was in San Francisco at the annual meeting of uh, Armenian Bar Association and we discussed this issue. Uh, I came up with a request, I made a claim, I made a pledge because we view diaspora as a source of financial support oftentimes. But we have an intellectual potential there, we have an intellectual capacity which unfortunately for various reasons has been isolated uh, from addressing issues in this society, putting financial considerations aside because you cannot do everything with money only. But some steps are being taken along these lines as well. Uh, I've, been, I've tried to identify issues, uh, then we'll be setting up a body under the auspices of the Ministry, a board uh, to make sure that we engage this potential at an expert level. And it's not only about the legal profession. In the medical uh, field, we have this initiative whereby Armenian uh, doctors of Armenian origin perform surgeries in Armenia. So this uh, experience should become contagious and it should be rolled out across the spectrum. I wanted to know, for quite a while by now, in Armenia, has there been any decision taken whereby uh, mines are subject to privatization? If not, how come people sell lands to aliens? Uh, no, you can't privatize it because it's national wealth. Uh, you give it out for management as a concession. It's right to use it is what you sell. You said that for you, the society uh, should come up with a demand for justice. Uh, cases of the first of March. Don't you think that a political will position is required rather than the demand from the society? Let me try and phrase it as follows. Some members of the society believe that all tools were not put to good use to solve the cases related to the events, which is deplorable. There was a tragedy, there were victims, and there is nothing you can do to soothe the pain except organizing or having transparent, fair trials, finding those at fault, bringing them to justice. And when it comes to the toolkit, well, some things happened for which these were not enough. But then again, it should all be so justified, so sound, that there are no doubts left. And this was the main thrust of the recent developments. Did we err somewhere? Was there anything that we missed in the process? Without interfering with the process, I'm sure that this initiative will ensure the public ownership of this. will be in a position to say that this is where we erred, this is who erred, and this is what do what we do to fix the problem and bringing those at fault to justice. But when it becomes specific at a personal level, we should make sure that investigation proceedings are very sound to make sure that people don't have a shadow of a doubt. Plus, our uh, NGO. My question is as follow so Armenian citizens uh, go to court on all kinds of issues no matter how petty these issues are can't we create kind of an extrajudiciary body to refer people there 
uh, in the 90s, people did not go to court, as you remember. And those who went to court uh, enjoyed the fame of malicious complainers. Now people are go to court increasingly, which is a good development. I think our uh, constitution was misinterpreted in a sense that um, uh, foreclosure uh, happens only by uh, decision of court of law. Not really. And then as uh, the law on uh, bailiffs, uh, execution of uh, decisions of courts, of law was taken, so uh, there is a procedure that you have to abide by, you don't pay, uh, you either go to court uh, or you have to appeal the decision which makes you pay. If you fail to do that, then bailiffs will come after you and they will make sure that this administrative proceeding is instigated or acted upon. And under this arrangement, uh, the courts will be relieved of quite a lot of their duty because administrative courts carry this impossibly heavy burden of cases related to failure to pay. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for your very candid answers. Let's thank the Minister for that. Thank you.